A very warm welcome to you indeed this morning. Good morning. We're gathered to worship this morning with the words of the very first psalm. And the opening words of that psalm begin like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Let's stand if we're able and sing hymn 132, 132, Immortal, Invisible. to the Corinthians, we read that no human being might boast in the presence of God, so it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Please be seated as we prepare our hearts for prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you are immortal invisible, and the only wise God. And so our delight is in your law, and our only boast is in your name. We are blessed by you for even knowing our Creator and your love for your children, for it blesses us with assurance for the future and peace for the day. There are times that we take poor counsel or stand in the company with sinners or sit with those who scoff at others. There are times when our delight is not in your law, far less day and night, and we break it in thought, word, and deed. There are times when we boast about ourselves, 
and what we think we have achieved without reference to the fact that you are our constant aid for all these things. Forgive us, Lord. You do forgive us. And you continue to bless us out of your grace and love. You bless us with a confidence in life that comes from knowing you, with a knowledge of you that causes us to love you deeper, with a faith and hope that gets us through the trials of life and an abundant joy especially in the company of your people that causes others to wonder at the source of that joy which is in you through Christ. In everything then, we submit ourselves to you for you to do us good and to know our every need even before we bring them to you. And so we pray together with the words that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I wonder if we might have some of the children join me at the front this morning. And I think we might be a little bit lighter on children, perhaps with it being um, the September weekend. But we'll see how we go. Let's have one or two up. I'm really looking for at least everybody that's not yet in high school. And if we lower numbers of those who are not quite in high school, maybe those in the first couple of years of secondary. We've got all the pre-high schoolers here. That's grand, lovely. Good, good. Hi, yeah, Ascot. Can I just say, Harry, I love your suit. <laughs> you look absolutely smashing. You really do. And. You're all looking fine as well, can I just say, but I just especially love Harry's suit, so he's picking that out this morning. Can I ask you something? It's a really serious question this morning, and it's not just for our children, can I just say. It's for everybody here, and you might not like to answer this one, I'm afraid. But have you ever stolen something? There's a lot of people not admitting it. Have you ever ever stolen something? Oh, I've got a couple of hands that are kind of like just about <laughs> navel height, but they're not really getting up. Thank, thank you, Ed. Good on you. Thanks for your honesty. I won't ask you to explain what. It's all right. Someone's heart? It was a kiss from a young lady. <laughs> I might have known. I might have known. <laughs> I think that's quite acceptable. Well done. <laughs> because we're talking about the Eighth Commandment today, which is thou shalt not steal. But I think if there's an exception to thou shalt not steal, perhaps we'll let that one away with that one. What do you think? Yes? No? I think we'll let Ian away with that one. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> when I was probably about, let me think, how old would I have been? I think I would have been about maybe 10, maybe even 9. I remember getting halfway down the street. We'd all been in Woolworths at the time. Of course, Woolworths doesn't exist anymore, does it? Uh, Wilco's is the nearest thing now, Wilkinson's. Um, we got halfway down the street out of, of Woolworths that morning, and my mother suddenly turned around with absolute horror to realize that my wee sister, who's probably about Harry's age, actually, maybe a little bit older, had um, been in at the pick and mix. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? The pick and mix, we get to choose all the sweets you want and put them into you. Yeah, you know them, don't you? 
<laughs> she'd been at the pick and mix and she had said when we'd all been going around Woolworths at that morning that, you know, we're not having anything. I don't know what it was we had done. I think maybe we'd been in trouble for something, but we weren't allowed anything from the pick and mix that day. So my wee sister, tagging along at the end, decided to help herself. <laughs> uh -huh, that was a little bit naughty, wasn't it? She stole the pick and mix. But I mean, she was just this high and she was used to getting it, let's be honest. And uh, there she was, munching away. I have to say, me and my brother, because I've got a brother between myself and my sister, we were, <laughs> we were jealous, to be honest with you, because there she was, munching away at the pick and mix, and we hadn't had a chance to have any. But, uh, but she was, she was uh, in trouble for that. Probably a couple of years before that, um, I'd got in trouble. I, I'd actually stolen something. I will tell you this wee story. I'd stolen something. Uh, when we'd moved down to England uh, when I was age six, probably a couple of years later this was, I'd be about eight maybe, um, with some neighbours a couple of doors down who had lads about the same age as me and my brother. And we'd been in their house this one day playing with the toys and I broke one of their toys. And they were really annoyed as you probably appreciate. And uh, so they said, you, you'll have to replace it, you'll have to get us a toy back. I says, I can't, I don't know where you'd get it from. I haven't got any money anyway, how to do it? They says, you'll have to steal it then. <laughs> and Muggins here, age eight, wasn't very wise. He took them at the word, and what did he do? The next time he was in the shop with toys, he found something that looked a little bit like what it was. I'll tell you actually what it was, shall I, because it'll probably help. For those that ever, maybe the gents will know this better than the ladies, maybe the ladies know it as well. Do you remember Action Man? Do you remember Action Man came with all sorts of different accoutrements, including these tiny little guns and, and all this kind of thing. Anyway, it was a tiny little gun and I'd somehow managed to break this thing. So there I was in this shop and found the, the, the section that had the Action Man stuff in it. And there was this little gun. I thought, oh, there it is. And it reminded me what these boys had told me I had to do for them. I'd forgotten up to that point. And so I picked it up. And I put it down. And I picked it up. And I put it down. I uh, picked up again, and I slipped into my pocket, and I walked down the aisle. I wasn't looking shifty at all, was I? <laughs> and I walked down the aisle, and I got as far as the, uh, the door, and who should grab me but the store detective? And you better believe I went completely bright red and was highly embarrassed. I was carted off to the office behind the scenes. I didn't know what happened next, but a good five, ten minutes later, to my further mortal embarrassment, and tears started coming down there, of course, my parents appeared, and my mother was absolutely distraught. You can imagine this, can't you? You're smiling. You can imagine this, can't you? You can imagine me getting in trouble, can't you? You're enjoying that, aren't you? <laughs> You better believe I've got an absolute rollicking uh, for having not just mortified my mother, but um, completely embarrassing her and bringing shame on the family. Really? My mother was really, really upset at the shame that she felt I'd brought on the family. And I, she conveyed that to me in no uncertain terms. I felt really, really upset and embarrassed myself. The shock of being caught the embarrassment of it, the shame on the family, the upset in the car all the way home. These were the days, incidentally, you'll maybe remember these, where you didn't have to wear seat belts if you were in the back. And actually, I was sitting in the boot. <laughs> I wasn't just in the doghouse, I was in the boot. Uh, with the rest of my brothers and sisters in, in uh, the seat, next seat forward, knowing what I'd done. <coughs> Could look around every now and then to see me in the doghouse. Thou shalt not steal. God's given us a command not to steal. And we know ourselves that it's wrong even without being taught that particular command. There's a shame in stealing something. There's a shame in being caught stealing something as well. And it comes in all sorts of different ways, all different shapes and sizes. From stealing a kiss all the way through to uh, stealing something else. Stealing things. Stealing somebody's peace. Do you realize you can steal somebody's peace? 
Some people are very good at stealing other people's peace and maybe make it a bit of a, uh, a habit. Last month, we looked at, when we were looking at the Ten Commandments, we looked at adultery, stealing relationships. It's a big one. Stealing someone's reputation. Or last June, before the holidays, we looked at murder, thou shalt not murder. Stealing life. They're all different types of theft, aren't they? Although we don't think of murder uh, and, and adultery in terms of theft specifically, but uh, theft in its wider sense also includes that as well. But we're reminded this morning, as we look at our catechism and the Ten Commandments, that the Eighth Commandment is, thou shalt not steal. As we're encouraged today by that law of God, that we shouldn't steal things. So of stealing things, God wants us to give things. He wants us to share. And perhaps remember that saying that there's more pleasure in giving than there is in receiving. And so God's way is one of giving and giving and generously giving. He wants us to serve one another rather than merely taking. And so the hymn we're going to sing next, sing hymn 694, uh, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You, talks just about this. Now this hymn, it's quite a number of verses in it. We're going to sing the first three verses, then we're going to sing the last verse, verse number six. So four verses in total, verses one, two, and three, and then verse six of Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. Our first reading this morning is from James, chapter 3, verse 13, to chapter 4, verse 3, page 946 in the New English Bible. Who among you is wise or clever? Let his right conduct give practical proof of it with the modesty that comes of wisdom. 
But if you are harbouring bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, consider whether your claims are not false and a defiance of the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above. It is earthbound, sensual, demonic. For with jealousy and ambition come disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is in the first place pure and then peace-loving, considerate and open to reason. It is straightforward and sincere, rich in mercy and in the kindly deeds that are its fruit. True justice is the harvest reaped by peacemakers from seeds sown in a spirit of peace. What causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Do they not spring from the aggressiveness of your bodily desires? You want something which you cannot have, and so you are bent on murder. You are envious and cannot attain your ambition, and so you quarrel and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not pray for it. Or if you do, your requests are not granted because you pray from wrong motives to spend what you get on your pleasures. Amen. We now sing hymn 501, Take This Moment, Sign and Space. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we draw near to you, remembering those who are near and far. And especially with the events of this week, with the wild weather that was experienced earlier in the week, we pray for those who have suffered loss, and especially the loss of life. We know of at least two in Ireland who lost their lives in different circumstances. And so we pray for their families and their friends for the loss that they now experience that has taken place because of this natural disaster. Similarly, Lord, we pray for the families of those who have been lost in gun crime in the USA 
in this past week. So many instances that have been drawn to our attention through the media when every single life involved a family and a circle of friends who now grieve at that loss and that sudden way in which their lives were snatched from them and snatched from their own presence. In a similar vein, our own country is not short of those who've been murdered. In recent years, there's been the situation in London where knife crime has been on the rise, where over a hundred have lost their lives to, to blades in the course of this last year. This is something we know well, Lord. Glasgow itself was known as the knife crime uh, capital of Europe for so long. And lessons were learned, lessons which we hope will do some good down in that capital city of London. But meanwhile, Lord, we appreciate that although numbers in the hundreds are numbers that seem so high and so large for us to, to really conceive properly, that each one of those lives lost again had a family and a circle of friends around it that has experienced that loss from their midst. And so we pray for them. We pray for a moment for young Gracie, a lassie in the Air Cadets down in England who's been recently diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumour. She faces chemotherapy and radiotherapy. We pray for her family and for her friends, those in her squadron. We too know those in similar circumstances at this time or in recent times past and even distant times past who come so readily to mind and so for those that we know who have faced such things or are facing such things for those whose family and friends mourn we pray Lord that you would be with them we pray too at this time for the family of Anne Dixon we pray for all those who have suffered such loss of life in recent days. But we've also this day been thinking not just of the loss of life, especially life that has been taken prematurely and life which has been taken of others. But even as we considered with the younger ones, there are many things that are stolen from us. Lives can be stolen from us but also material things as well. As we pray for those who've had possessions stolen through either war or through sheer greed. We pray for those who find themselves at difficulty in life because of such greed. We pray, Lord, that you would be near all those whom we have spoken about this morning. We ask that you would help us to see the difficulties in our midst. Difficulties in our own lives and that of our family and friends. Especially those around about us, either sitting in the pews, or for that matter, living in our own neighborhoods. And we also ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to rise above the injustice of this world and give others a hand. Help us in all these things. For the sake of Christ, our King. Amen. We listen to our choir as they sing, Blessed are the pure in heart.
Our second reading is from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They now left that district and made a journey through Galilee. Jesus wished it to be kept secret, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is now to be given up into the power of men, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he said and were afraid to ask. So they came to Capernaum, and when he was indoors, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? They were silent, because on the way they had been discussing who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must make himself last of all and servant of all. Then he took a child, set him in front of them, and put his arm round him. Whoever receives one of these children in my name, he said, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not only me, but the one who sent me. Amen. May God bless you as these readings of his holy word. We sing hymn 374, From Heaven You Came.
Let us pray. And the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I asked a difficult question a little bit earlier. I want to ask another one. Who here has never, ever had an argument? <laughs> I'm not sure if they heard me, Alan. Can you maybe turn the volume up just a little bit there? Who here has never, ever had an argument? We've got Mr. Horn? Mr. Gilroy? <laughs> a couple of weeks ago I told you about my favorite passage of scripture which of course was in James and we can look at James again this morning and just a few moments ago but remember that passage that I talked about about the necessity necessity rather to be swift to hear slow to anger now of course there are two different types of argument there are those that are simply part of debate, and there are those that are full of rancor. And then we see debates, for example, in the House of Commons. And that, perhaps, to your mind, and certainly to mine, appears to be more of the, the latter type. It's not so much debate, it actually seems to be very often full of rancor. For if a child can argue, really an infant, I think we're talking about children that may be a little bit older, if a child can argue and bicker, surely it takes an adult child to truly take it to the hammer and tong stage of arguing one with another. And you know, these kind of arguments very often are based in self-interest. In self-interest. It's possible to argue on behalf of someone else, Maybe we can get our rage up a little bit when we're thinking about someone suffering injustice. But I want to suggest to you that perhaps 90% of all arguments are based to some degree or another on self-interest. Self-interest. Even if it's where we have that bit of righteous indignation about feeling that it's our rights that have been trodden upon. It's still a measure of self-interest to be found in those kind of arguments. But so often arguments have other things associated with them. Jealousy. Selfishness. Boasting. Untruth. These are the kind of things very often that arguments are involved with or, or that are involved in arguments themselves. And these are the arguments we perhaps see modelled for us in politics. I've mentioned the House of Commons already, but in politics, in the media. And so often, they spill over into our own lives. And if they spill over into our own lives, as an example, they tend to rage like a storm. Perhaps a little bit like the storms that we've seen in recent days there with Storm Alley. Did they find a barrier or a dam in our spiritual lives? Where is that sea wall that's going to protect all that's precious from the damage of the storms as they come in? Now, I want to just go off a slight tangent for a second. In the Old Testament, God's people were instructed to make sacrifices for every wrong that they had done. And sometimes arguments would be part of the wrongs that they had done, especially if these arguments escalated. But you know as well as I do that Jesus taught us a better way, a far better way. He taught us a path to reconciliation. If you bring in your sacrifice and you realize that there's something between you and someone else, leave your sacrifice there and go off, make it right with your brother, with your sister, then come back and make your sacrifice. And in Christ himself, God reconciles himself to the world. If Jesus instructed us 
that if we know that someone else has something against us, that we leave our sacrifice, go off and make it right, and then come back to make that sacrifice, how much more so has God himself literally put the matter right there in his own example in making us right with him when we're the ones in the wrong in sending his own dear son to reconcile himself to the world now arguments can burst out we've all experienced it except for myself perhaps Graham and Archie now, we've all experienced it but don't let them fester. Don't let them cause you regret, especially perhaps some years down the line as you recall them and the opportunity to undo them is no longer there. And also because, I would suggest to you this morning, it will hinder your worship to God. And your worship to God through one another and your life in general. Note now the words of James. James chapter 3 from verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Are we? Do we hope to be? Do we hope to answer that question in our hearts in the affirmative? Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. This is earthly, unspiritual, Demonic. Other translations have within the thrust of those few short verses the idea of bitter argument and how bitter argument can be. Bitter jealousies, bitter selfish ambition, bitter boasting, bitter falsehood to the truth, bitter, bitter, bitter are arguments. And it's not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's entirely earthly, unspiritual, even demonic in some cases. Are we showing, rather, our works, the good that we do to one another, friend and foe? Are we showing those works in meekness? Not in weakness, incidentally, but in meekness, in humility. Pride and, and the honour that we get are those perhaps what are in our minds rather, rather than letting our left hand not know what our right hand's doing. Or, as James also says, wanting something we can't get. And when we don't get it, finding something rankling within that makes us prone, rather than to humility, makes us prone to some form of bitterness and even being argumentative. And this has two sides, doesn't it? Our day-to-day -day life and our worship. Surely how we approach sun our church on a Sunday is different from how things are in the real world. Is that so? Can you separate such things? Is creation separate from the creator? Could work be separated from the worker? Can worship be separated from life itself? Can we have a Sunday worship that does not affect our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday worship, and so on through the week? Can we have a day-to-day -day life that sits in a box that we just pop up on a shelf and that doesn't intrude into our Sunday worship? Is there a sacred, secular divide? Do you remember your last argument? Or perhaps just the last big one? 
Is it coming to mind? Is it still sitting in your head? Even now. Even now as you sit in church on a Sunday, just awaiting a trigger or permission to let it jump out of the box, jump off that shelf and into your mind and into your presence while we're here worshipping together. I just gave it permission effectively by asking you to think about it. Of course those arguments are carried with us wherever we are, whether it's church or not. So hold it just for a moment, please. Hold that argument just for a moment. I'd like you just for a moment to consider how important it is when held before Almighty God who forgives you everything for the sake of his Son. Think about the apologies that we owe him and that we make to him regularly in prayer. We did it again this morning. Think about how we might dissolve our arguments in such an apology and humility. Because, you know, apologies can often be the greatest sea wall against the storms of an argument that are there and possible. It takes a little humility to apologize. And humbly done, an apology can start, at least start, to calm things down. Maybe not immediately, not in the force of the gale, so to speak, but they're part of the picture of what helps dissolve these arguments that all of us have experienced. Yet, still we argue with one another. We allow our relationships to be disrupted, even for a little while, our relationships with one another, with ourselves, as we hurt our own hearts, perhaps not just in a metaphorical sense as well, holding on to anger and upset, as we hurt our relationship with God. We can't be divorced from any aspect of our lives. We hinder our worship, our true worship, the worship that affects every single part of our lives and all of our good works on earth. And among other things, this can affect our prayers. God still hears us. He's the hearer of prayer. Perhaps it's just one reason, however, that causes him to reply, no. Has God ever said no to you? He certainly said it's done to me. Our worship is hindered by what's going on inside our hearts. James says in verse uh, 3 of the next chapter, which we read again this morning, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Perhaps James had in mind an occasion that we, we read, read about, we read about in general, but we also read this morning, between Jesus and his disciples. Whether he had read Mark's gospel, or perhaps just knew the stories, given that he was likely martyred in 69 AD, we find that even Jesus' disciples struggled with these kind of sins. And let's call them what they are, they're sins. And how it must have infuriated Jesus day by day by day as he saw his own disciples arguing about all manner of things. But he didn't let it bubble to the surface. He dealt with it. He dealt with it privately and at the right time. And there perhaps is some wisdom for us be it male or female, dealing with things at the right time. I just want to re read just two verses uh, just now from that Gospel of Mark we read, Mark chapter 9. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Their time with Jesus was being hindered 
by their self-interest and their arguments. Time is such a precious thing. It is such a precious commodity. We have a limited time, and we don't know what that limited time is to each and every one of us. Every single second, minute, and hour is precious. So why would we fill it with so much self-interest and argument? And so much more so, perhaps we might think about the disciples. In that short, although they didn't know it, that short ministry that Jesus had right there in their midst. The short time we have together to worship together on a Sunday morning or the lives that we share together. It's such a short period of time. Why waste it in the self-interest of arguments? So Jesus teaches them an object lesson in humility. He sat down and he called the twelve and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. He took a child, probably an infant, who'd soon enough learn to argue and to fight, but for now was guileless. And taking him into his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. How we deal with one another and our heart's motivation affects our worship day by day by day for good or for ill, promotion or hindrance. We read earlier, and I'll read it again. James said, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Jesus, in another place, said, Suffer the little children with a wild abandon and, and their lack of spite. They're an example to us all, and their worship, their worship, is unhindered before God. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. May we find apologies and humility as the sea wall against all arguments. And might we find ourselves as infants when it comes to harsh words and bitterness, putting the simple love of Christ at the heart of our relationships, our relationship with God, with ourselves, with each other. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. We continue our worship as our offerings are brought forward.
Let's dedicate these our offerings. Let us pray. Lord, may our worship be unhindered as we lay our gifts before you, dedicated to your kingdom in the name of Christ. Amen. We conclude this morning with hymn 457. All hail the power of Jesus' name. And there we'll read, uh, or sing rather, the first verse and the last two verses. Verse 1, 3, and 4. All hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs> as we go from this place to take our worship unhindered into the world. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide upon you, all whom you love, and all whom you find difficult to love, now and evermore. <laughs>